Hi everyone, welcome to this session. I'm pleased to introduce um, Jose Luis Ambite. Dr. Jose Luis Ambite is an associate research professor at the computer science department and a research team leader at the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. He's an expert on information integration, including schema mapping, entity linkage, and efficient query rewriting. His research interests include databases, knowledge representation, semantic web, information extraction, knowledge graphs, and genetics, and uh, biomedical data science. He will be presenting a talk titled Building a Knowledge Graph of Data Science Training Resources. Please join me in welcoming uh, Jose Luis. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Or can you hear me? Is the speaker? Okay, so thank you very much, Nilofar. Um, so I'm going to talk about a fun project that I had, or I have still, um, which is about building a knowledge graph of data science trained resources. Um, and this was funded by the National Institute of Health. And I'll describe a little bit of the context of the project and then and the knowledge graph construction itself. Um, so I'm presenting, I'm Luis Ambire, but this was a large team of people based mostly at the Information Sciences Institute, which is located in Marina del Rey. It's not here in the main campus, although I'm also part of the computer science department. And at the USC Stevens Near Imaging and Informatics Institute. Uh, basically at ISI, we did most of the kind of data collection, the collection of the information resources, the modeling, the organization. And this project also has some aspects of in-person training on data science. And that was mostly done at the New Imaging and Informatics Institute in the Keck School of Medicine. And they also set up the website itself, although the data that powers the website came from ISI. And then we have a collaboration with people from the School of Cinematic Arts because we made a movie on big data. Or they made a movie on big data. So it's on the website. You can, you can check it out. So what's the big context? So uh, the National Institute of Health uh, set up this program called uh, Big Data to Knowledge, and it was the premier data science program at NIH. And they decided to fund about 12 centers of excellence on data science applied to biomedical uh, data. And here's a list of these centers. They went all over the of different domains on, on, on biomedical domains, from genomics to mobile health, uh, data retrieval, neuroimaging, um, different types of domains. And in this ecosystem, they also funded uh, what is called the Big Data to Knowledge Training Coordinating Center. And this center has several activities. Um, I won't cover most of them in this class. They had a lot of in-person training, uh, these uh, innovation labs, uh, different international collaborations. Um, what I will focus in, in, in this lecture, on this talk, is essentially about how we created this index of uh, training resources on the web, openly available on the web. So we thought that this was a data science audience. We created this large index of materials to learn data science. Uh, it has a biomedical focus, but it's fairly general, and I thought it could be interested for, for the data, DataCon LA kind of community. Uh, and that's what I was mostly will focus on, but I just want to show you a little bit of the kind of things that uh, the center did that were in-person training, which I won't talk about, but there was a, this innovation lab uh, on mobile health and in a nice resort, and people went there to learn from experts in mobile health and big data. Um, they was another one on, uh, what was this one? Uh, can't remember. Oh, it was cell dynamics um, and, um, and another one on uh, environmental health and so on. So this was mostly done by, led by Jack Van, Jack Van Horn at the uh, Keck School of Medicine. Uh, but what we did was to create an index of training materials that can be accessed through the web portal of the V2K TCC. And if you go there, then you can see there's different activities. But essentially like a search engine. So you want to learn about some topic in data science, you type some keywords, and we will get you a bunch of resources about data science. So it's like a little Google for data science videos, mostly. So most of the resources are videos. We have about 12,000 resources indexed, mostly of them videos. And then if you like resources because you want to learn about them, you can create a little plan for you and create an account and kind of drop your uh, favorite uh, materials to, to proceed. What is unique of what we did is that 
we want to support our science learning, so training people in data science, but we didn't want to build an index by hand, so we wanted to use data science techniques to build the index about data science. So we use a lot of machine learning and information extraction and things of this sort to actually build the index. And this is freely available. Uh, you can go to bigdataU.org and, and play with it. Uh, you want to learn a bit more of the details, you can read this paper, and I have some papers uh, sprinkled along the, the talk. Um, so this index, uh, I, we don't copy the materials, we leave the materials where they are, and where do we get the data? So uh, something is not stable. Um, so first we identified high quality training resources, materials on the web. Uh, I don't know. Uh, they, they came from the B2K center, so these 12 centers, they already have training components, they were producing materials. Something is not. Um, we went where you may, may, many of you have gone, the, um, the MOOCs, the online courses like Coursera, UFD, edX, so we index these courses. But then we did things that are probably more interesting. We got a lot of scientific lectures on data science from tutorials, keynote talks that are on the web. Uh, there's a site that many, some of you may know, it's called videolectures.net, they videotape uh, scientific conferences, so like this one, I don't know if it goes to video lectures or not, but uh, they have, so we, we got a lot of the materials from them, and then we went to YouTube, and we literally searched on YouTube for data science terms. And then Google tries hard to give you good results, but we learn classifiers to select and identify what the best kind of more uh, didactically or pedagogically meaningful uh, resources. Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, maybe this is not there. We should have tried it. It, it looked okay when we tried first. Yeah. It's all good. You have to. Oh. No, no, it looks. I can see it here. Uh, okay. We have more options. Well, I'll keep talking over uh, while we finish this. But anyway, we identified uh, training resources from open open resources, mostly free resources, with a focus on, on video that were available on the web, and we not only identify them. Sometimes because we knew they were good quality resource. Okay, no, no, it looks good. Looks good for a minute. <laughs> okay, let's see how this goes. Maybe I shouldn't play with it. Um, uh, so the resources from the electrical net, from YouTube, uh, describe how we do the identification in YouTube, and then from other books and other, other projects in Europe, there was a large project called Elixir, integrating biomedical data in Europe, and they have a similar project, and we cross-listed some of the resources with them. But beyond identifying them, what we did is we described them. We map all these data that is extracted from different sources. We map them to a common schema. The common schema was mapped to schema.org, and then we tagged the videos. We said, okay, this video is about deep learning. It's about probabilistic graphical models. So we created an ontology with about 100 concepts, and we uh, automatically labeled or, or tagged all these videos. Uh, using uh, machine learning. Um, since we want the, the, since we want the, the index to be of high quality, we did everything automatically, but we also run everything through human curation. So we had a curation interface in which like, curators will make sure that our predictions were good. And, um, and then to make the whole thing more of a graph, uh, we, try to find prerequisites between resources. And I'll go through all these different things. Oh, it's the door. Okay, I'm just like freaking me out. I think it's like a feedback from the... <laughs> and, and the idea was to provide personalized training paths for a user learning goal. So you would type something and we would give you a path of things to do. So that's, we're not quite there, but that's kind of the ultimate goal. So how did we build this, this, this index? So, we extracted lots of data from different resources and we scraped websites to get the metadata. And then we ran some of these automatic quality, uh, quality classifier for YouTube. Um, then all that data is, um, 
mapped into a database or a graph. We describe all the metadata about the resources. Again, we don't store the videos. The Coursera keeps their videos. We just create a, a, a pointer and make it easier to find those resources for, for users. Um, and we linked to, we made a graph in which basically the instructors and organizations are actually objects and, uh, and they are kind of all related to each other. Uh, we tag all the videos using the, this ontology that we define. Uh, we find dependencies between resources. And in the portal, what you see right now, if you go today, is a, this is a faceted search interface using Elasticsearch. Uh, we did some other tools, like uh, some kind of visualization. And what's working in progress is the personalization engine that will kind of tailor the resources to your interests. But right now, you still get to manual educational plans. So you can select things and keep them in your own personal space for you to watch as a way of keeping track. So what's the resource database that we build or this graph? So here are the major contributors to the graph. The bottom line is that we have about 12,000 resources, and these resources are of different granularity. Some of the things are like full courses, so if like the Andrew Ang machine learning course, so there will be a record for that, okay? Um, and we went to edX, Coursera Udacity. We got lots of things for uh, video lectures, and these are generally scientific talks. It could be at NIPS, or it could be at other kind of uh, scientific conferences. The materials from the V2K program itself, and other different sites that we found useful information. Uh, so we're talking about informatics, for example, is the informatics dot in Canada that had useful information. Uh, the information that we extract from there is all the metadata, like the title, the auth, the instructors, the organizations, the syllabus, uh, syllabi, things like that. Um, so we have here a breakup of what, how, for how many we have kind of just a description, we have transcripts. So if there's a video, if there's a transcript, like the closed caption of the video, we will take that too, because it helps us to classify what the video is about. And if there are slides, for example, um, in, in video lectures, there are many of the sites that have slides. So we also get that, because we extract, we do information extraction from there to help classify. But the bottom line, we have almost 12,000. Actually, in the pipeline, we have more than 12,000. Uh, but I think in the current index, there's only 12,000 right now. Um, OK, so. So this is more or less the, the process. We go to a website like this, and we will create uh, a wrapper, a screen scraper that will get all this information from the website, like the title, and the summary, description of the course, uh, maybe sometimes the, the level, um, things like uh, the syllabi, syllabus, uh, and uh, the author, and the affiliations. Um, we built a uh, scraper system. Well, a scraper system was not, this was not rocket science, but we used Ricecape and Beautiful Soup to deal, deal with complex websites. We actually, in, in the group I come from, there was a lot of work on uh, using machine learning for, for, uh, for, uh, to learn screen scrapers, not to write them by hand. But here, we literally, by hand, we just created a Docker image to make it more e easier to, to extract. But then that takes all these sources and creates some kind of database. Uh, more interesting is the work that we did on uh, YouTube. Uh, so we ran about 100 queries using terms of this ontology, things like uh, neuroimaging and data science. So Google will try very hard to give you very relevant results to neuroimaging and data science. Uh, and we ran 100, about 100 queries like this, extracted uh, thousands of videos for each of them for a total of 100,000 videos. And then we learned a classifier to create high quality videos. Uh, we did kind of the hard way. We labeled some videos, which ones were good or bad. It's kind of hard to tell if you go to YouTube what's a high quality training resource or not. I mean, what's up? Something that has pedagogical value. Uh, so we just trained. Here's a bit of kind of the sense of the sources uh, of, the, of the queries. For some queries, we get like a few tens. For other queries, we get like tens of thousands. So we scrape all of those. And you get videos like this. Some I don't know, downloads the book for free. Well, that's not really a good training resource. But this one, which is like intro to R from some course in uh, empirical industrial organization course, that's probably a good system. So we had classification on that. And we used different methods, but it was a uh, random forest. And we use a number of features that are extracted from YouTube, like the number of dislikes, the description, after it has been transformed to word to back, subtitles, the title, number of likes, number of views, duration, tags. For example, you have a very short video, sometimes not very useful, so you're looking for things maybe like half an hour, an hour, things like that, it's a lecture, a talk. Um, and we got decent experimental results, like an F score of about 80%. 
which is okay, it's, it's good enough to basically to select the top videos and, and, and give them to, uh, to the curator interface. Okay, so as I said, we have extracted data from all these different sources. So we wanted to map it to a common schema. Uh, so we define a schema for learning materials or training materials, and we explore a number of existing standards for uh, training resources. There's uh, the Dublin Core, the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative. So over time, the IEEE Learning Object Metadata. So we look at all the attributes and classes that these systems use. But finally, we kind of, I don't know if anybody from Google here, but we drank the Kool-Aid and aligned to schema.org. And there was a, pal a parallel effort in, in Europe in this Elixir project that are defining this bioschema.org in which we also have description of uh, courses and training materials. So you align with them, and it's not a very complicated schema, but it basically tells you, well, here's a, a resource, it's a creative work, and it has an author, and which is an instructor, and it has an affiliation, some kind of organization, and, and, and so on. Uh, all this is publicly available. Uh, we actually public the whole data set on this common schema at Senodo. So if you want to get these 12,000 material resources, you can go here and just download it. Uh, the license is attribution, non-commercial, share alike. The USC lawyers told us to make no commercial. So sorry for people in companies, but you have to talk to somebody at USC if you want to use it. But other than that, you can just use it freely and create derivative works. And this is how it looks. Uh, so there will be some resource. It's a creative work because that's the map, what we map into schema. And it's a course that is about regression models. It was taught by Brian Caffold, Jeff Leake, and Rory Depeng, which happened to be at John Hopkins University. And it was also in Coursera. And there were several talks it's about regression, and it was a video, and it has also written documents. And we have a description. So you have all these kind of records, and this is what we extract from all these 12,000 uh, resources. Um, and if you notice, this, the people, the instructors, are not strings. They're actually objects. So there would be, oh, well, we have it both in JSON-LD. I don't know if people are familiar with JSON-LD. It's a way of uh, JSON format for linked data. And this is in uh, RDF, which is another way of describing data on the semantic web. Uh, so it's a resource. It's a kind of creative work. It's the same information. And as I was saying, all these, uh, the authors are not just a string. It's not Brian Crawford string. It's actually an object. So we have information about these objects. And we'll come back later how we link uh, to the actual objects. OK, so now the automatic tagging, where all these uh, tags about being about regression or, or deep learning and so on. So we define uh, a small ontology, about 120 concepts. Um, the way we derive ontology was interesting. We did both bottom up and top down. So we have our own understanding of data science. Uh, we also got some concepts from existing biomedical uh, ontologies. But we also basically extracted from all the descriptions that we had, we did noun phrase extraction, and we ran topic models, and we tried to, f to label those topic models with the more meaningful uh, kind of keywords. And that's how we came up with this small ontology. And it will have something like, this is kind of the domain or the field of knowledge, and here is like, I don't know, eventually there's computer science somewhere, and here is, I don't know, natural language processing, and knowledge presentation, and eventually, I can't read this anymore, but, and similar learning, and concepts of like, like that. And those are the labels that we apply to the videos. Uh, again, this is also publicly available. It's in both uh, uh, BioPortal, which is a site that uh, shares ontologies, and in our own GitHub repository. Uh, that's the BioPortal website, and here you see some of the terms. Again, this could be much, much deeper. We purposely kept it fairly shallow because we wanted to have good precision predicting the labels. So you have, we have gone like very deep into some kind of, I don't know, type of, subtype of variational autoencoders. We may not have had enough training, training data to really predict that with accuracy. So we kept it at somehow a shallow level, but everything is still a useful thing. And the automatic tagging, again, nothing super uh, sophisticated, but we got all the resources, we got all the text, and the text, it comes from what we extract from the websites. Uh, and it was a video, if we got the captions, we got the data from the caption, the text from the captions, if we had slides, we were the, the PDF uh, text. And we run that through basically a text, text prediction task. We can vectorize the text and run different classifiers to predict each of these tags. And I didn't describe the ontology, but the ontology, most of the concepts are from the domain, which is the, the type of thing that it is. But then we have other, other um, so it's an ontology with six hierarchical dimensions. Um, and 
for each of these dimensions, we have different accuracies, but we get reasonable accuracies. Not uh, F1 scores about 80%. 1% is easy to predict the, for, easy to predict the format. Uh, the, the other types, uh, you have like imaging data, you have video, you have text, you have uh, uh, time series data, things like that. Um, so with this, we create a number of tags uh, automatically. And then for those resources that we think are high quality and we have a number of tags predicted for them, we actually feed them to a human curation interface. And we define a simple web, well, we created a, a, a curation interface, a web-based curation interface, so that users, well, users, curators, we hire students to do this and some people to do this. They will look at particular resource like this. We have the URL, we have a description, and it, well, is a good quality or not? And they will say yes, no. If they say yes, they get presented with the predicted tags, and then they can either confirm that this was fine, add additional tags that we have missed, uh, remove some tags, and we use that to kind of retrain in the algorithms. So every time that the human curates, then we feed back into, into the uh, training process. Okay, so that's about the, we've extracted the resource, we map it to a common schema, we have described it somehow richly with these tags, and now we're going to link it so that it's uh, more of a knowledge graph. So we try to make this as linked data. I don't know if people here are familiar with the semantic web of linked data, but the, the idea of semantic web is to make the web readable for machines, not just for humans. No, you go to a website and you can read it as a human, but it would be nice if uh, a machine, your program, could also read the website without having to do some complex scraping in a, in a more uh, easier way. And there are a number of languages that have been defined, RDF that I referred to before, and more sophisticated language like the ontology web language, OWL, that you can embed in the pages to provide a structured data behind the page that is machine processable. And that's why Google is, is pushing this schema.org initiative in which they embed structured data in the page. So they don't have to do some complex extraction or natural language processing of the page, but just they can, they can uh, essentially read the, the metadata, the, structure metadata embedded in the page. And in our website, we actually, I saw you this JSON-LD before, every single resource in our, in our website has that little structure metadata. So if you go to the page, you can just, your program can read the metadata, you don't have to do some complex scraping. Um, anyway, but we want to make it more linked so that everything are objects, not just the strings. Um, so what we did was to mention the people, which are the structures generally, and the organizations, you know, the affiliations of these structures, to well-known entities. And those well-known entities come from DBpedia, and DBpedia is like a semantic web version or a database version of Wikipedia. So everything that's in Wikipedia and all the information that is in the info boxes is also normalized in a database and it's called DBpedia, which is described in RDF. Uh, there are other, did this work with DBpedia, there's another effort right now, which is called Wikidata, uh, that maybe we, we mark to that one, it's, it's a bit more popular now. Uh, we also map things to DBLP, so if it's an instructor, we map to your DBLP profile. And DBLP is a computer science bibliography that has all your publications, or a lot of your publications. If you publish in computer science, most of your publications should be in DBLP. They scrape all the, all the, all the conferences. And that gives us an idea of how good this instructor is. Is somebody that has published like 100 papers, so he's probably a very famous. We also map the organization, so if you're affiliated with a university or a big company, then we know that you are affiliated with USC or with IBM or, or Google or whatever. And we map all this information uh, to enhance the value of our records. Uh, we did essentially ADT linkage, it's called here. So we, there were about uh, 1,200 references to organizations, about, I mean, this may be a bit out of date, but about 7,000 references to people. And we map, uh, so when we extract from, the, from a website, it would be Andrew Eng, the string. Uh, but I want to say is Andrew Eng, the famous computer scientist that started Coursera. Uh, and as a professor at Stanford. Uh, so we basically solve these linking problems. We kind of dereference uh, or the, uh, deduplicate different mentions between a big data use. So Andrew Eng may have multiple courses that we have scraped. Uh, we map from data U to DBpedia, that data U to DBLP, and then we make sure that if we match to the same object, then DBpedia and DBLP are all also consistent. And we use simple record linkage, kind of extreme similarity techniques to do this. Um, uh, there are a number of resources that are, we built in a number of resources that already existed. For the Wikipedia, there's already a lookup service. There's uh, another a spotlight that they annotate the entities. We just constructed 
URLs and they reference them and that kind of surprisingly found some things. Uh, we use some constraints like if we get a match of uh, some in person in the Wikipedia, and if it's a university or a scientist, something like that, it's probably a good match. If it's a kind of a sport, uh, uh, a sports team member or died before 1980, well, it's probably not given a course on the web right now, so it's probably about match. So we use some constraints and domain knowledge to filter the entities. And, and similar things with the BLP. Um, again, there could be very sophisticated semantic similarity methods that we have used, but this was fairly simple in uh, current examples. We have used string similarity using Mon Monger Elkan. Um, but it actually worked reasonably well. So we did a, an evaluation with about 100 references and 200 uh, people with two and three annota annotators. And this is the inter annotator agreement. So people don't always agree with themselves all the time. Um, so even humans to humans, you see this uh, about only 88% they agree among each other who should be the right, the right person. And this happens like if you have a very common last name and you're Bob Smith, which Bob Smith you are. Um, and the system was able to get close to that human internet agreement, even with the simple techniques, although that can be improved. And then when we run the evaluations, when two of the three annotators agree, we get like a 96, uh, 96 accuracy, 96 percent accuracy. Uh, and when the three of the three annotators agree, we get a little bit better. So in organization, it was a bit more distinct, like it was only in the 80s when two of the three, but when three of the three agreements, then it was better precision. Um, so what that means is that now we can have these nice resources in which both the resource itself has a well-defined URL that is unique on the kind of web of linked data, and also the people have well-defined URLs, and you can find more information about these people. Um, so the resource now is perfectly nicely described as objects. Everything comes with it from ontology or from well-known entities. When you go to a well-known entity like a person, we'll tell them, like, here's Jeff Hinton. It's a person, has a name, that's a string, but no, we know it's a, it's a real entity, and this is the mapping to Wikipedia to the DLP, this is his own URL, or, or was, I guess he moved to Google. Um, his, his, uh, his affiliation, University of Toronto, his description that I think comes from Wikipedia, Wikipedia. And the same thing for organizations. He has a USC, the object that has a name, and he has a Wikipedia URL. Uh, so this organization that we define locally as our own organization is the same as the Wikipedia USC. And again, this description is taken from the Wikipedia. Um, okay, and why did we, one side effect of linking to the, to the entities and organizations is that now we can use things like use the personal links to the BLP to find the number of publications and then understand also the, the link to the reputation of the university. So we actually use that to tweak a little bit the results that you get on the, on the website. So you, we, you search, it's primarily an information retrieval search using Elasticsearch. But you also get little boosts if you, the instructor, like Andrew Eng, comes from a, has lots of publications and comes from a well-known university. So you get better results. And this is a bit debatable, but because maybe some, you have an awesome talk, but maybe you don't get it all the way. But we're trying to basically make sure that the top resources are high quality resources. And this is one of the techniques that we use to do that. And finally, on and I'm almost done, uh, that's 10 minutes? Okay, then I'm perfect. Um, and finally, this is current work, ongoing work on resource dependencies, and we have um, finding, so when the ultimate goal here is like you would search some topic that you wanted to learn about data science, and we will give you a personalized learning path of how, which videos to watch in, in a sequence for you to learn about a topic. So maybe you want to learn about variational autoencoders, and before that maybe you need to know something about autoencoders, and before that about neural networks, and before about logistic regression. So give you something that will, depending on your profile, will get you from where you are to, to what you need, where you want to go. Um, and this is steps in creating that, that vision. Um, so we, we try to identify how different resources depend on each other. So what are the, essentially what are the prerequisites of a video? Um, and again, we want to do it uh, using machine learning techniques. Uh, I should say that there are people that have actually done these knowledge maps by hand. Um, if you have gone to 
Khan Academy, they have a beautiful concept graph of all their videos, which is amazing. And these people at Meta Academy, I don't know if you know this site, but Meta Academy is these two people, two experts that work very hard and created these beautiful graphs of all kinds of topics in data science. And this was, a, as far as I understand it, a manual effort. And it's, I mean, it's beautiful. But um, still, I mean, they cannot cover everything because data science is a fast changing, changing field and that's why we want to do things automatically. And what if we wanted to expand to different domains? So it's not about biomedical bias, it's about uh, geoscience or something else. Uh, so we had an, an idea um, which was to exploit. So we, we tried different things to find prerequisites. And if you have ideas about how to find dependencies between resources, please talk to me. I'll be super happy to learn them. But this is one idea that, that we had that was used to use Wikipedia. So it turns out that Wikipedia publishes their clickstream. So all the clicks that people do in Wikipedia, there's some public resources that you can get. So people go to the uh, neural networks page uh, in Wikipedia, and then they realize, I don't really know what this logis logistic function is, and then and they click in logistic function, and then they go to that page. And it turns out that's a very strong signal to find how different topics or different concepts kind of order. And we try to exploit that. Um, so we, we got the Wikipedia releases, the clickstream, uh, that tell you how people navigate from one page to another. And then we try to, pre to create prerequisites with different ways. Now, if they go from A to B, B to A, different combinations. Um, there were some particular features that this kind of normalized work work navigation that was the most informative. And this is what I was saying, that you, can, you went to the learning, and from there you went to the neural network page because you realized there was a sort of neural network in that deep learning thing. Um, if, if you want to go the details, you should read the paper. I have the papers in the bibliography. Uh, but it turns out that we tested it in different data sets. Um, essentially, when we create a balanced data set that has more or less the same number of... So, uh, prerequisites is kind of an unbalanced data set. There are many things that are not prerequisites of anything, okay? There's only a few things that have dependencies and many things that have a dependency relationship. So when you train on a balanced data set that we, that we extracted from Meta Academy, we actually get fairly good results. I mean, we try different classifiers. Some of them don't do that great. But with AdaBoost, we have got in this kind of 80% accuracy of well, prediction and, and F1, recall and F1, which is more or less what we think is good enough to basically then send to a human curator to verify because there are not going to be that many dependencies that we find. Um, okay, so I'm almost done. I'm just going to tell you a few more features. Hopefully, from this, you get a sense that we have now this knowledge network or knowledge graph of resources. We have described the resources. They're all uniformly described. All the main entities are real entities or objects. So you have resources, trained resources. You have people that are linked to DBpedia, to DBLP, to ArcIDs organizations, and then we have some the beginning of dependencies between the resources that that's kind of the ultimate kind of knowledge graph that tells you how to navigate this kind of web of knowledge. Um, other things that you will see, you find in the website, we, we played a little bit with how to visualize this large, as I said. Um, so we actually took all our resources, and this is um, basically, we run a big topic model, LDA, over all the resources that we have, including some that are not actually accessible right now, but we, we got all the kind of 12,000 videos plus a few more thousand Google books about data science uh, that we have identified, but they're not quite accessible yet through the, through, the, through the website. But in the website, you can get this beautiful map. Oh, well, I think it's really beautiful, uh, which is basically the LDA topics uh, reviews using TSNE, and it gives you fairly reasonable things. You get kind of reasonable groupings like neuroscience and bioinformatics, and you can kind of zoom in probably hard for you to see from there. Um, but you begin to see you know, all the dimensional interaction methods, neural me network methods, probabilistic graphical models. And if you click in any of these dots, you see a particular resource. And this is like, I don't know, Learning Deep Architecture for AI by Joshua Bengio. And these are the topics in the topic model that tell us that define these methods. So you can kind of browse around. This is like on the web and, and give a feeling of what these clusters are about and maybe in a more serendipitous way, you can find relevant materials to your interests. Or you can just search directly, but this is another way of, of doing that. And uh, just to conclude, so what have we done? We're working towards this knowledge graph of data science training resources. We have indexed about 12,000 right now, mostly videos. We plan to, plan to add written materials, books, and things like that soon. And they're all uniformly described in a schema.org. 
and this, this is your concepts, this little ontology. We automatically do the ontology assignment. Uh, we created everything as linked data, so everything are real objects that point to people, and I mean, on DBLP you can find more information, like the age index of the person, or how many publications they have. Um, we are working on automatic Brexit detection. And as next steps, we want to keep adding resources. We have out of YouTube videos that haven't added yet. Uh, we expect to add a few thousand more so shortly. Um, improve all the automatic learning techniques, the resource identification, the tagging classifiers, uh, the ranking of the search. I mean, we played with this boosting the ranking based on, on like the popularity of the university or, or the productivity of the person, but there could be other ideas that are more relevant or more personalized to your interests. Uh, entity linkage, improve that. More curation, a lot of more work on identifying the dependencies. That's really exciting. And real personalization. So the idea was to, I mean, at least people kind of recommendation engine type of things. People that watch this video also watch this video. Um, this type of resources. And then further personalization. So here are a few publications that I already included in the proposal. And thank you. Uh, go to the website. And is there any question? That's the view from my office, by the way. Thank it's you a nice very view. much for the nice presentation. This is your certificate oh, thank of you. application. And thank you for listening. Um, any questions? Uh -huh. About three slides back, the T sneak rat um, mm -hmm. chart. You had some scores there, it looked like, and some other information uh, as well. Let me see. Explain oh. that. Oops, sorry, I'm going the direction. Uh, these are the. Oh, I lost. Can you? Can I get back in the? Sorry. Uh, so this, this is the topic, and these are the weights for each of the words in the topic. This comes from LDA. Those are the LDA topic model weights. There's no. There was nothing super sophisticated there, but. So that that tells you that tells you basically just tells you that this phrase neural networks, is very relevant to that particular resource, which obviously is about deep learning, so it is, it's kind of correct. But also has a little bit of, I mean, and other ones are like really not so much, I don't know, psychology. So you, you can get a sense of how good a map, I mean, it's just literally it's just doing LDA and, and clustering things using the LDA vectors. We, we did a little bit of uh, uh, pruning and, and clean of the LDA vectors. Sometimes the LDA topics are not very clean, so if there was something that was very all over the place, we removed it from the computation. Uh, any other questions or comments? So what oh, yeah. music, medical imaging, and robots, why are those near each other? At the bottom and the center. Where? This one? Yeah. I'm not but sure. What does this actually show other than, OK, it's the weights and the clusters? OK. This was not the primary thing. However, we took, so basically, the, I mean, if you're familiar with topic models, they create this cluster of words, okay, and that's a topic. There were like 100 topics, uh, I, I think, about 100 topics. That creates a vector. That's like a, every resource now has a 100 dimension vector. We just cluster it using Disney. So why music and medical imaging come together, I really don't know. <laughs> so don't, don't put too much weight. I think it's more meaningful the how close the, uh, so this color coding also has a meaning. Uh, that's the, the, the ones that have the primary topic of those things. So this is more meaningful within the distance between two different clusters is not that meaningful, I would say. But anyway, that was not the primary effort. The primary effort was to create the curated set of resources that you can search. So, so the primary, this was just, with, we thought it would be nice in the interface, but I mean, the real, I mean, what should be, what you should try, and then if you don't like it, you should tell me, is when you search, you should get relevant result, results in this kind of search, search box. Okay, anyone? You can, we can talk offline or in the reception. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I hope it was okay. I did okay on time. Sorry? I did okay on time. I, I was not really okay.